My today's guest is Dr. Manon Bollinger. Dr. Bollinger is an award-winning naturopathic medical doctor. She's international speaker, best-selling author of multiple books. She is the founder and CEO of Bowen College. In her 30 plus years of working as a naturopathic medical doctor, she has helped thousands of patients heal from chronic pain, from trauma and stress-related chronic diseases. Dr. M, thank you for joining me here today. I'm super excited. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me um, over. <laughs> so um, I would like to know all about your work. Maybe you can start by telling me a little bit about you specialize in healing trauma, healing um, chronic pain and stress related, you know, chronic diseases and especially pain. So um, maybe you can give me a little bit background on how this all got started. Why did you choose this specialty? Okay, uh, absolutely. So uh, one of the things that happened is, is my own experience. After I had finished um, naturopathic training, which is you know three years pre-med, four years full-time, a lot of people don't know what that is, but it, it gives us actually the ability to diagnose and use Western medicine and also uh, be able to prescribe natural solutions uh, for health problems where, where possible. So we can use um, you know, botanical medicine, acupuncture, um, we can use um, you know, so different modalities that are right. out there. Right. And what happened to me is I ended up going to a workshop um, and I always had this strange feeling that there was something peculiar or odd about my knees. Um, I had no pain, particularly. I had no history of an injury that I had had, but I noticed that I could never have my knees touched. It just made me squirm. I, <laughs> I didn't understand it. So during this, um, this um, training, I actually volunteered to be the, the patient and so I'm, I'm lying on this table and within minutes, literally of the treatment, I'm, I'm, I'm back, transported back into my blue room of my childhood. I was supposed to be a boy <laughs> anyway, <laughs> in my crib. And, you know, I can see myself and feel myself. I'm looking up at the uh, airplane mobile twirling above me. And I realize I'm howling, like howling like the most frustrated two-year-old in the world. And, um, and this whole experience, I, I didn't know where it came from. And so in my mind's eye, I saw that I had these two little white shoes in the crib, right? Held right. apart by a metal bar that was forcing my feet open. And so, I mean, it was the, the treatment at the time, right? This was what they were doing. And the idea is I had foot pronation. So my feet were inwards. Right. And yeah. this was the method to actually bring the feet out. But at that time, which is um, many years ago, um, they didn't pay attention to the um, integrative aspect of our whole body and psyche and our whole being. So you force the feet, but you don't pay attention to the ankles, to the knees, but you also don't pay attention to the human experience. That would be this two-year-old that is stuck in the crib. And because of this metal bar, you know, literally can't turn. Yeah. Right. So what I realized is that the body holds memories and, you know, I, at the time I called my mom and I said, what it, like, is this true? I had this complete as a flashback, right? Yeah. And I, but I didn't know about it. And then she right. said, oh yeah, yes, you have. And actually I have a mirror yeah. <laughs> right somewhere near here, wow. but I think this is just podcast. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, so she, uh, she gave them to me and she had kept them uh, to tell me one day uh, what, what, um, you know, what happened, but, you know, she did the best at the time, that's what was happening. You know, that's the suggested um, protocol, but yeah. what it did for me could have been many things. So it could have 
been a serious deep trauma, that's possible. Uh, but it also, for me, it really informed and changed the direction of my practice in medicine. Because now I realize that the body holds memories in a deep way. And that yeah, became yeah. my my passion. And so when I started um, uh, treating people, I used a, a work that I, I transformed. So I basically this realization allowed me to transform a musculoskeletal technique called Bowen therapy into what I call Bowen first therapy, which is the full integration of mind, body, and, you know, the fascia itself. Right. So, um, so that, that became, you know, for me, it was a gift. And the way I right. see life right. Right. is that, you know, everything happens for you, not to you. So I was in the right place at the right time. And, um, and then, you know, I used all my, my uh, knowledge as a naturopathic doctor and the understanding of meridian lines and Chinese you know, um, thinking of holistic health with and combined with homeopathy, which is, is a really interesting um, medicine as well, because it looks at the person as a totality. In other words, it's not our, we're not confined by our diseases, you know, right, right. the disease, the diagnosis is sort of well, if you have this, 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 and that, then you have this, right? Right. But right, the way right. the way that um, more Eastern medicines, and in this case, homeopathy, which is a Western medicine, um, looks at the person is that well, this is the way they have they are acting in relationship to their chronic disease or to their acute inflammatory disease, whichever one it is. So we exhibit we have a relationship with our body that, that um, identifies us as unique individuals. Right. So like if we take, for example, fever or something like that, right. uh, people have very different, they have you know, low fevers with um, dull headache and they're lethargic and they need to lie down and they may be thirstless. Whereas somebody else has red, piping hot cheeks, they hallucinate, um, they, they're very anxious. So we all have different ways with the same virus or the same bacteria right. to actually exhibit symptoms. So this is kind of our whole, um, there's no such thing as a bacteria on its own or a virus on its right. own. How it interacts with our body. Right. It's the effect it has on the individual, right? So yeah. you take, a, take a holistic approach. Love that. <clears throat> Which requires the individual, right? So right, what right. I did is I combined all of this and I looked at through the fascia and the fascia is, um, I'm just going to say how it's spelled because a lot of people don't know about this. Um, yeah. It's spelled F-A-S. CIA. So I, I look at it like it's their central intelligence service. <laughs> and okay. basically, it's the matrix, the connective tissue that surrounds all our organs and bones and covers us basically from head to toe. And it has, um, it, it, it really is responsible for bringing uh, chemical and emotional um, information throughout our body so we can repair wasn't seen that way in the past because um you know again in, in surgery they used to take it out they thought it was like bubble wrap you know right, right, <laughs> now right. now in the last i think 10 years or so it's starting to become like my goodness that it has its own nervous and chemical um, components and you know so now it's like a much bigger deal they realize too that it allows us to feel proprioception or something called interoception, right. which is our connection to our inner body. Yeah. Anyhow, so I'm giving you details, but all of this is really what I used as the, the, the body of work while it was being made to understand that people that have experienced trauma, and I'm just gonna go physical right now, it's true for emotional as well, but it, what happens is that our, our body gets 
in a sense, paralyzed in a state of fight or flight. You know, so we have a sympathetic overdrive. And so if you have, let's say, whiplash or something like that, and you had a car accident, well, the impact of the car accident can't be massaged out alone. Like massage is working on the muscles, but you must work on the entire person, the person who also had the trauma. And that's the work through fascia. And Bowen First is a unique methodology that with a simple uh, orchestrated touch, so there's certain spots in the body, it activates the, um, the innate intelligence of the body. And it actually takes the trauma out. It allows the trauma to release and the person to get on with healing. Yeah, yeah. this is this is very exciting. I, I really find this really fascinating. So you're um, activating the fascia, in, you know, you're by uh, these specific movements on different areas of the body, you're kind of activating the fascia. I love that. And does this have anything to do with the Chinese, the meridians of the body? Like, I'm just very curious to know about these points and where that comes from. So some of the, um, what's been understood now as fascial lines. So we have, we have um, fascial lines going through diagonally and, you know, in different parts of our, our bodies, different planes. And a lot of the fascial lines have a, a definite correlation to Chinese meridian lines. So there is, there is that. And also in, um, in, um, Indian like medicine in uh, what is Ayurvedic it called? medicine. Not, not, no, it's not Ayurvedic. It's a marma is the um, they're marma points, and they're actually points on the the back, which would in Chinese medicine be back shoe points, and and that um, correlate to even more specific moves <laughs> that that we do that release that tension in the body, which is you know it's very interesting. And then there's some moves that still to today i have no idea why they're there it's not trigger points it's not um i've still not made any other sense and you know and then like most things the science comes later right, right <laughs> you right. see you know i was seeing 150 people um a week you know for years and helping them so i wasn't gonna wait for the science to catch up <laughs> right. one day it will <laughs> but, uh, until then, you know, I just saw from my own eyes that yeah, the incredible yeah. shifts, you know. Right, right. I love that. So how does this relate to the emotional aspect? Because you also mentioned emotional trauma and this also, you know, translates into emotional trauma. How would this? Right. OK, well, let me let me give you I think the best is probably an example because um, Cases, no names, <laughs> but uh, it, it really makes a, a point. So I, um, I had a, um, a patient named, I'm just gonna name him Michael. And um, he contacted me because I, I lived at that time in Vancouver where there's a big film industry, right? So he was a Hollywood actor, quite well known. And his career had basically come to a screeching halt. Right. because he said he felt like his, his body was literally possessed. So I, I took you know, his case and he had seen a psychiatrist, he had seen therapists, he had seen body workers, he did massage. He was on anxiolytics you know, for right. anxiety, antidepressants. He was even an antipsychotics because his personality went like south. <laughs> it was, he was very, um, very upset and yeah. um, and when he spoke, um, so he came referred to me and um, when he spoke, he said that, so he had this spasm in his chest and he said it paralyzed him. And what happens is that patients describe pain very differently. So muscular pain elicits words like burning or uh, pulling, that type of pain. Whereas fascial pain, uh, people describe with words that are much more 
um, like emotional. So it could be like cruel or agonizing or paralyzing. So that was my clue that his experience had gotten into the fascia, into the matrix itself. And so I did the a Bowen first treatment. And what happened is during the treatment, the taste of anesthesia came up. And I didn't use anesthesia. I was just giving him the treatment, right? right. And when the taste of anesthesia came up, he also had this realization, this flashback, and it brought him back to the dental surgery. So he had an extreme fear of dental surgery. Right. right. And so what happened is that this big fear of dental surgery merged with, you know, the natural little bit of, you know, performance anxiety every time you, you perform, even, you know, well-known actors have that. Um, it's not a big diagnosis. It's just a little reality, but the two kind of um, latched together. They merged into one and his body couldn't differentiate which one. So every time he went to speak on stage, he found himself back in the dental chair, but unconsciously, he didn't even see the dental chair. Right. He was just absolutely in panic. So we, we did this, um, the, the work together. And, you know, I also spend time um, allowing the person to express, you know, what's, what's the circumstances, what's their context for pain, what's their beliefs, um, you know, what are the stories? There's lots of um, misconceptions about pain. So there's a lot, you know, to, to just to cover because, again, we're a whole being. And um, anyway, and with that context, which I, I call listen, it's about listening to your body, that and the actual fascial work, um, he, um, he was able to completely get rid of what had turned out to be PTSD and um, high, high levels of anxiety. And yeah. Um, yeah, that was like over 15 years ago and he's completely normal. But this would be a very clear example where there yeah. was the only physical manifestation was this, um, this spasm, but everything else was in his head. You know, and, and since then, of course, I mean, Harvard University says that, you know, one remembers the past to imagine the future and it's how we're wired but it doesn't mean that we're broken right we sometimes we just have our wires crossed which is why you can't look at one specialty or one part of the body to fix the whole it really requires a a holistic approach that also includes touch right. and so that's a I think that explains a little bit your question. Yeah, it does. That's that's beautiful. So this this is um, the the fact that he had this you know um, trauma in the past and um, what you explained at the very beginning that your the fight or flight response kind of gets strengthened with time. And what I understand from this case uh, study you just talked about is that his fight or flight response, the limbic brain was so overactivated that it was on like autopilot, like, um, you know, um, all the time. And he couldn't differentiate the, the speaking or the, you know, like going out there and performing experience with that past trauma is that correct yes it, it, it's exactly like that but it's not conscious yeah. in other words he had no idea that's why he said i feel like i'm possessed like what on earth is going on he didn't put two and two together his body put two those two things together right, right? and he didn't you know he, yes he was traumatized it, it didn't happen in his mind it wasn't chronological he didn't even know but the, um, the uh, anesthesia, which is, again, one of our uh, taste is one of the ways we experience and smell our, our memories and our history. And that came up in the treatment. And he was quite shocked. He goes, what, what is this? I'm tasting anesthesia, you know? And so 
you know, we went through and explained, well, first I don't talk, I just allow the body to do what it needs to do. But then we, you know, it was, it became obvious in our discussion of the experience, what was happening. And, and then it was like, his body just released it. It's like this, um, it was stuck literally in, in his fascia. And it's not um, just a mental thing. And that's what I think I, I really want to share that it's not, you know, we say mind over matter and the mind is ex extremely powerful. But I really think the body also has its own, its own intelligence that we were, we're starting to understand. We understand now, for example, how important the gut flora is to mental health. You know, it's not about playing chemicals with our brain only. It's what we eat and what we put in our gut affects our, our um, mental clarity and our mood and, you know, and all, all our neurotransmitters. So it's, um, our body has a, a big part to play in our body mind. Um, right, right, right. So the body mind, the other um, aspect of your work is body, something you call the body mind medicine. And this is something you also teach. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so I have basically, um, I'm the founder of Bowen College, uh, which teaches the, the physical therapy, which is the, the one of orchestrated specific moves on the fascia. But I also teach because to me, you cannot separate the two, what I call listen. And that's the um, innate intelligence uh, healing system. And that is really all about um, experiencing the body in a context of its actual experience here on earth. You know, so for example, um, in listen, L, it's, it's actually an acronym. <laughs> L is for love. So when we're in the process of healing, if we, if we are not loving to ourselves, if we don't even know what that means, if we feel that we're, we're just in constant reaction to the outside world, to the triggers that we perceive to be everything from the outside, right. then we cannot heal in the inside. So part of it is that we've been, I guess, programmed in some ways to believe that all the, that we're being attacked, that we're at war, we're at war with viruses and bacteria and symptoms, our own symptoms. You know, we've been convinced that, that it, in a sense, it's outside attacking us and we're the poor victims of this reality. That's really more or less the way that um, Western medicine views the body, but, but also the pharmaceutical industries view the body. Because as long as we think the solution is outside, then we're going to look for, uh, or the problem is outside, we're going to look for solutions on the outside. Yeah. Right? And, and of course, that, that's very um, financially viable a way of looking at things for uh, for the pharmaceutical industry but for the individual it's it's not the smartest way to look at things so what listen is is really a program that breaks down all the things that we have control of that clearly have an impact on our health so starting with love if for example, and, and you know, this has happened to so many patients with um, multiple sclerosis or um, you know autoimmune type of of, um, of conditions and diseases, is they may be in a abusive relationship with another or with themselves, right? And and then they uh, many times again i'm generalizing as i explained at the beginning there's no such thing as exactly the same yeah. but but i'm looking at tendencies that that if you don't have a loving discourse with yourself if you don't choose self-care if you don't um if you're not 
loving your life or finding the love in your life, right? Because sometimes we have circumstances that we may not change, but we can change how we live the circumstances. We can change our, our view of it, our position of it. We can align ourselves in a way that the, the experience doesn't destroy us and doesn't have a, a negative impact on us. So one of the biggest questions I ask people is when they make a change in their health, is this loving to you? the next step, whatever it is they're going to do. So let's say, you know, I, I had a patient who loves, um, I forgot if it's Pepsi or Coca-Cola, but anyways, um, they claim they needed it for energy, um, et cetera, et cetera. Plenty of reasons, which I call excuses, but anyway, plenty of them. And he was suffering from horrible headaches and you know and migraine headaches and then he had digestive it went on and on and on like right. you know you, you do something and the body goes down right you don't treat the body well well it, it gives you signs and symptoms to say hey wake up you know do something different right yeah. so he um um so we talked about it is this when you pick up your can of whatever it is and you start drinking is this loving to you you know and and he could not get past that and say, no, it's, it's not, it isn't loving to me. Like he could really clearly see in the moment. And so what we were, what we did with him is just bringing that consciousness. He chose something that was loving to him in that moment. And so it was like a mantra, every, every activity and, you know, within a period of about two, three months, he, he changed many of these things, including standing up to his boss, um, who was, you know, demanding extra hours. And then he had a two hour drive home. And there were so many unreasonable things. Yeah. Um, and he had, didn't deal with the conflict that he was experiencing there. Right. So we sort of like, what are, what's impacting us? And where can our um, alignment and, and vision support us? And where is it that we're playing victims and we're playing too small in our own life and in our own um, relationship to our body? So that's L. <laughs> and then I, we, I can go into many more details, but you know, that's a yeah. process of inquiry. Right, right, right. You know, so there's, there's many different... Um, I like many steps. I don't know if that's the, your interest to find that all of them, but I'm happy to share. But yes, absolutely, there is absolutely, a definite. Absolutely. So uh, the L was the, um, just so that, uh, you know, just to recap, L was the um, um, love, self-love aspect of this process. And you, uh, you kind of, you know, talk with your, your patients, your clients, and, you know, allow them to, um, understand what is self-loving and what is not. Am I correct? I have very specific um, homeworks that they can do. In, in fact, the entire program is available to, to all, all patients that are interested in going through this process. And I'm um, uh, currently making it available to my practitioners, um, like licensed out so that they also can run this so that there's a, a mindfulness and awareness component to their, their practice. And this is whether they're naturopathic or natural he healers or whether they're, they're um, allopathic or you know, conventional medicine. Right. Um, the process of awareness is, is very important. Uh, and, and I think many times practitioners feel that they're the only ones responsible for their patient and it's not it should not be that way it's it isn't possible that way because healing doesn't happen right because right, another right. one gives you something right, right? right. okay yeah. so that's available to your um you you know the the healthcare practitioners that you are teaching so they can also you know go through this um this process of you know self healing I, I i absolutely love that and they can also you know incorporate these teachings in their practice 
Love that, love that. So I'm very interested to know the rest of the um, aspects of the, uh, the first one was love. And what was the acronym again? So um, listen. listen, so the next one is I. Okay. And I is all about inquiry. So it's really the um, thinking through so inquiry is, is all about the mind. Okay. So this time it's what are our beliefs, right? What are our values? Um, what did we, what did we inherit and what have we learned that we've never questioned? So for example, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I was brought up, you know, finish your plate, there's a lot of uh, poor people in the world, you know, um, you know, you, you need to be grateful for the food that you have and finish it. Right. Now, I mean, in principle, I understand, but, but if my relationship to food at the time was like, I am full, I, you know, don't serve me so much. I don't want that or whatever the relationship might've been. Right. right. And, and again, I think, you know, you're smiling because many people have this experience right. Right. <laughs> and, so, and we have different stories about this experience. And yeah. again, in and of itself, it seems harmless, but it sets patterns, unquestioned patterns in our operations, in how we, how we see the world, you know, like yeah. Yeah. Uh, more is better. You know, that's a, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, if I can have more, that's better. Well, more is not necessarily better. Yeah. Right. So, again, these are just their assumptions and there's so many of them. So we go through what are the how have we been brought up? What are the assumptions that we're living by? And then we question that because basically there are thoughts that are um, automatic to our behaviors and, and these thoughts inform our behaviors. And so in order to make real lasting change, we also must look at this and see whether these thoughts are, are um, thoughts that en enable us to keep a, a, a bad habit or something that is destructive or does it actually support us positively in life? So again, I have tons of different exercises, ways of breaking this down, um, you know, turning the thought around. And, and my general belief, I mean, is that, that thoughts in, are kind of separate. They're almost like a, an egoic process of the body. It's not our truth. The, our thoughts are just thoughts. And so I often tell people if they don't like the thought after we've analyzed it, right? This is not just like, if you don't like it, throw it away. Yeah. <laughs> but once we've done the work, if the thought is not um, supporting us and giving us, yeah, giving us love again, giving us um, the feeling of, um, of joy and that, then put it in a cloud and send it off. And, and so don't engage it because if we engage our negative thoughts or negative, usually self-talk, it doesn't help us. No one's ever gotten, you know, feeling fabulous by having and listening and believing the thoughts that don't serve them. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Just love that. Right. That, that's uh, that. And then S is, um, so the next one in listen, so L-I-S. S is symptoms as symbols. And um, so, you know, we often metaphoric language and symbols have been used traditionally and, and forever in, in healing practices. We identify and often experience our symptoms this way. And so what I help people do is draw out the metaphorical or symbolic language of the way they describe what they're experiencing. And what's um, incredible is that often it's the very same way of seeing the world that they saw when they were a child or that they saw earlier. It's like th th these symbols run through our life and once we become aware of this, then we can also um, envision 
a more uh, more nurturing and more supportive of the heal of our healing process um, way of looking at things. Right. Could you please give an example of the symbols and symptoms, um, just so yeah. so that I understand it better? a very simple simple one okay <laughs> there's many more complex ones but i'll give you a simple one um so so a person says oh you know my um my nasal cavity is obstructed so and obstructed sounds like a normal word it's a way of saying clogged up etc but in taking the full history everything was obstructed in her life so she saw obstructions everywhere it's, it's almost like her, her way of, of engaging the world was with the understanding that there were obstructions everywhere that needed to be overcome. So it's the language that we use that gives away, um, you know, a lot of deeper information about where the symptoms are coming from. Would that be correct? The language and yeah, and, and the stories around it, you know. So um, I had, for example, the story of uh, I'm a wilted rose. And I was at one point in a relationship where I was not feeling, um, feeling loved. But the truth was I wasn't being, I wasn't loving myself. I wasn't nourishing myself. And um and so I had this imagery of, you know, because I believed I should be a beautiful rose, you know, because somewhere in my childhood, my, you know, probably my, my mom said, you know, something beautiful about a, a rose or me, I don't know, I can't remember, but that was my symbolism. And so I saw this wilted, sad rose in, in a pot that was basically dying. Yeah. And so that was the imagery um, and at that point, I had multiple sclerosis. And um, so it was, it was fascinating. Like my listen program is actually written from my experience as having experienced MS and also um, stage four cancer. Yeah. So I, um, I had the, <laughs> I don't know what the right word in English is, but the, the honor of going through these, these uh, right. conditions right. and getting to the other side and really searching uh, deep on what are the roots of this, not just biochemically, but emotionally and, and spiritually and all of it, and which is, you know, how I created the Listen program. It, it really right. came as a step-by-step -step because it were exact my steps. You know? right. It's an incredible story, you know, the, the fact that, you know, what you just said, uh, experiencing the other side, you being a medical doctor, you know, someone who is, uh, has the role of the healer, also experiencing the side of the patient. That's incredible. I'm going to touch, I'm going to go back, circle back to that and ask you a little more about that because that's really um, inc an incredible story. However, can we also l finish the, the, the listen because I find that really fascinating. I would love to, love to get to the end of that. So T is for touch. And one of the things that I, I've noticed is that um, touch is incredibly powerful and touch uh, reduces pain itself, right? So, right. Um, I mean, I, I teach through that some of the, uh, the do on your, at home, like in your family, how to do the Bowen first um, therapy, which I call reboot. But it's really all about uh, when we experience injury or toxic load, and it doesn't matter whether it's uh, chemical or emotional, this ground substance, the fascia is disrupted and we become aware of the disruption uh, because we feel either, you know, tightness, pain, inflammation, blocks, sometimes it's scar tissue. And one of the um, best ways to release that is through touch. And then there's you know a whole bunch of um, uh, chemical reactions that happen, uh, you know like physical soothing therapy boosts serotonin by as much as like thirty percent 
it decreases stress hormones, it raises dopamine levels. Um, and so therefore it's really helpful uh, in uh, activating the pain-killing endorphins through the oxytocin uh, pathway. It improves sleep, uh, sleep reduces fatigue, um, decreases um, cortisol, for example. So all of the things I said, plus many of the physiological things, but one of the biggest aspects of, of um, of touch is that the body can feel safe and it's the felt experience of safe that also allows us to heal. So many people who have been traumatized, um, touch is not that easy. In fact, touch is quite scary. And so I, I, I help people rehabilitate that in work they can do themselves to, um, yeah, to, to allow all those positive hormones <laughs> to circulate in our in our body and to to reconnect to our own um, beauty as as humans and and our own body physically. So that's T. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and then E is engage. And engage. It's one of the ways definitely of, of empowering ourselves but th that i would say is the most energetic of all of the rest the rest you know is is more mental emotional spiritual uh and i i don't mean necessarily at all religious um can be but it's not um it's not needed um but yeah engage is really about your your focus in life, your alignment to your true essence, to your what you're here on, on earth to be, not to do, but what is your, your essence and then how to, to bring that, to allow that, the, that inner you to emerge in its full beauty and brilliance. And so, some of the people who have gone through my training and that they use it for business. <laughs> they use it to be clear in their, in their um, connection to their purpose and to their goal. Because if there's misalignment, it can go in strange ways. And then you, you create patterns that sabotage your end results. And, and it's all because you haven't cleared the path and all the obstacles that come along the way. So we, we work on that. Um, we work on clearing this, not deeply going into it, because that can also um, sort of uh, like cement the wheels. You know, it's almost like the more we go into uh, negative thoughts and beliefs, the the more we make them real right like to acknowledge them and see them is part i believe is can be very helpful but it's not how we heal it G going deeper into the story never really um changes the narrative it it perpetuates the narrative so this alignment to our real goal and what we want whether it's a joyful relationship, whether it's whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. Um, that is much more an energetic work. Um, so we, we clear and we, we focus on that. So that's engage. And that's like that feeling where you just love your life. You know, you have joy, you have, um, yeah, <laughs> like there's, you know, the world is your world. You've, you've created it at this point. And um, so of course you're in love with it. So that's um, N, no, that's E, that's pardon e. me. And N is now. <laughs> so it really is about what are the exact next steps and what are the parts that you have not addressed, whether it's in your health, in your life, um, in your relationships, in all of that. So it's sort of more like a, um, a, a clearing of what, it, what else is left and a plan of action for the, the next step. So that is listen. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. I absolutely love the listen. <laughs> I, I love it. Absolutely fascinating. 
Circling back to what you were talking about previously, that you being a medical, um, a naturopathic medical doctor, and um, you know working for over 30 years helping patients and helping other um, doctors, um, um, you know to learn all these methods. But you have also experienced the other side of being a doctor. You have gone through stage four cancer. You have had MS, and you have you know come out from those extremely difficult you know situations in life and come out of them, overcome them and come out of them, you know, successfully. And what have you learned from those experiences and what was it like? Can you please tell us a little bit about your personal journey? You know, when you, when you experience something yourself, it, it, it makes you deeply understand how disempowering our general medical system is. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's the, the compassion and the and the passion I have yeah. for um, empowering patients so that they don't feel that their diagnosis leads to their prognosis. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, there's this prognosis and it's like, oh, well, you will die in this month amount of time yeah. according to statistics. Well, you know, yeah, is that true? And I guess by doing this work, I, I question that. And I also question how they figured that out and who were the people that chose what was you know like how how did that statistic how does that one statistic relate to me and my agency in my life and i just felt like well why would it you know i have my own other criteria, other things i'm considering you know, whether it's different foods, whether it's different thoughts, whether it's all of the things we, we talked about, I just felt like there's more, there's more to it. So, so that gave me a, a huge um, advantage, suspecting that I wasn't going to be just a number falling into the simple categories that they had established for me. So, uh, but, it, but was it difficult? Yes. Um, because when I went, um, I had signed, you know, that I'll be part, m most oncology uh, treatments or organ removal or whatever are always part of studies, understandably, because we're trying to study and understand more. So in my case, it was a hysterectomy. And um, I had signed and I was lying there um, and I just, I, I couldn't go through with it. I just couldn't. And it was like, no, I'm, I'm not, I, I can't. I just, this is not feeling right. It's not aligned. It's not my time to go, but not only that, it's not removing an, a cancerous organ was never going to remove the cancerous relationship I had with my then partner. And I just knew it. It's like, it would just be removing the symptom, but not getting to the root cause. And um, I mean, and again, I'm not recommending this. <laughs> like Sometimes surgeries are good. Sometimes it's perfectly aligned. Um, you know, it, it, this is not a prescription. <laughs> this is my experience and what I did right. with the knowledge and the understanding I had about healing. Because don't forget, I was already in practice. Yeah. So I had already helped people, we can't use the word cure, so I won't, but, you know, help people um, do very well in circumstances where they had a prognosis that was significantly worse. Um, I think that's the safe way to say that anyway. But so for me, it's like I, I got up and I was lying there. I remember all these nurses and doctors were hovering around me. And at that point, I had three young children. My youngest was one years old. And um, so it was, it was terrifying, yes. but terrifying in the sense of the amount of shame and guilt um, and blame, like, how dare you? How could you not go through with this? And so I, I remember feeling very fully the, the intensity of what it must be like for a person who has no medical background, who has 
um, who didn't have my life experience to understand that I had a chance, I had a good chance. Yeah. Um, you know, so anyway, that was my experience. It was, it was yeah. quite terrifying, you know, <laughs> Wow. but I, I, um, and I found, um, I found oncologists to work with. Uh, it took me a while because uh, since I refused to be part of this experiment, yeah. uh, they, they would not see me again. Yeah. Right. So I had to yeah. find other people, but um, within six months, I was clear. Wow. Yeah. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. It's an incredible story of, of a success, you know, how you can, you know, with your, if you go your um, path and, you know, stick to your, stick to your principles and, you know, just follow your intuition that you, you know, can come up with a great outcome. I absolutely love that story. So when people want to learn more about your work and, you know, the teachings, um, the programs and courses that you offer, where can they, where can they find all the information? Yeah, th there's, um, I mean, there's my website. If people can pronounce the name, <laughs> it's, um, it's actually drmanoboligier.com. So my entire name which um, I think you'll write it somewhere on the <clears throat> on the podcast, yeah. but .com, um, which has a list of what else I do and the programs available. Um, there's also Bowen College, spelled B-O-W-E-N, college, like a college, .com, which is more for that physical modality, and you can <clears throat> make um, appointments to find out more. And then there's a program, Simple Solutions for Stress. So that one you might remember because it's uh, it's 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 spelled as you hear it's simple solutions for stress .com. And what that is, is um, is really a master class that explains a lot of what I'm talking about and um, allows you if you're interested to to, you know, dig in deeper. My my goal is a healer in every household. Yeah, which yeah. is um, what my new book actually um, that just made an Amazon bestseller is, is all about is taking charge of our health. Yeah. So a healer in every household is also available to you. Awesome. We're going to we're going to link everything in the descriptions. I thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Bollinger for for this incredible opportunity to have this conversation with you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me here. It was a pleasure. Thank you.